Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Caleb Brown and I'm the Curator of Dinosaur Systematics and Evolution here at the Royal Terrell Museum. Uh, on behalf of the Royal Terrell Museum and the Royal Terrell Museum Cooperating Society, I'd like to welcome everyone to the 2024 uh, Royal Terrell Museum Cooperating Society Speaker Series. Uh, the Cooperating Society is a nonprofit charitable organization that supports research, uh, educational programming, exhibits, and local community initiatives uh, through the management of the museum shop and the administration of donations and memberships. The Cooperating Society plays an important uh, uh, role in helping the museum achieve its mandate, including supporting the speaker series. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to introduce this morning's speaker uh, for the fifth talk of the speaker series, uh, Dr. Thomas Cullen, uh, assistant professor and curator from Auburn University. Uh, originally from Ottawa, Ontario, Tom started his volunteering and later working uh, at the Canadian Museum of Nature uh, while obtaining his Bachelor of Science and Master's of Science in Earth Science um, at Carleton University. He then completed a PhD in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Toronto and Royal Ontario Museum. Uh, following his PhD, uh, he worked in postdoctoral post positions at a variety of institutions, including the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago, uh, the North Carolina Museum of Natural Science in Raleigh, uh, and Carleton University in Ottawa. Uh, in 2023, uh, Tom joined the faculty at Auburn University in Alabama as assistant professor in the Department of Geoscience. Tom's research focuses on ecology, evolution, and life history of dinosaurs and other extant sorry, other extinct organisms, uh, with particular focus on understanding how uh, terrestrial and coastal ecosystems responded to environmental disruptions under uh, greenhouse climates. In addition to his research, um, Tom teaches courses and supervises students, has advised in the development of museum exhibits and TV documentaries, and in, is involved with ongoing community science programs and outreach initiatives. Uh, his favorite part of the job is working outside doing fieldwork, uh, and has been fortunate enough to do uh, field work in a variety of expeditions on multiple continents, including extensive experience uh, here in the Badlands of Southern Alberta and in the mountains of Northern BC. Uh, Tom's talk today will highlight some of his research on dinosaur diets and is titled, You Are What You Eat, Revealing Dinosaur Diets Through Fossil uh, Tooth Chemistry. Uh, so with that, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Cullen to the podium. All right, thanks, Caleb. Can everyone hear me? Okay, great. So, as Caleb said, I'll be talking about a bit of my uh, ongoing research using um, the chemistry of teeth uh, to look at uh, the ecology of dinosaurs. And I'm going to add a couple little minor things to my title. We'll talk about dinosaurs and also some other animals. We're looking at diets, maybe how they use their habitats too. And we'll be mostly talking about fossils, but I might talk about some modern, modern organisms too as a comparison. So like Caleb said, um, I do a bunch of different sort of research. Um, I've been lucky enough to work with a lot of museums historically, even though my current position is primarily uh, university-based. And field work has been a, a big component of, of um, my work sort of historically and ongoing, where um, I'm really interested in understanding the interface between the environment that we see in the rocks and um, changes in the different distributions and relative abundances of the, the different fossil species that are preserved uh, in those rocks. So my overall research spans a whole bunch of areas, um, but what I'll be focusing on today is up here and how we can use chemistry to actually tease out some questions about diet, behavior, movement, habitat use, things like that. And so to set the sort of stage for most of um, the work that I'm doing is it's focused on primarily the late Cretaceous. Um, I'm putting about 75 million years, but give or take um, as the sort of focal point. And at this time, as many of you probably are already aware, the Earth was quite a bit warmer than it is today. It was a greenhouse world. We had higher atmospheric carbon dioxide, warmer temperatures, higher sea levels, and sort of related to that last point, uh, often restricted or fragmentary land masses. Most of the focus of my work, as well as, of course, the area of interest of many around here as well, is what's going on in this western part of North America at this time, and particularly what's going on 
in areas in, in Alberta and southern Alberta. So at this time, of course, North America was cut in two through this uh, shallow seaway, the Western Interior Seaway, with the sort of two halves of North America being named, um, or often called in the literature, Laramidia and Appalachia. And so one of the interesting things that's been noted in, in studies of dinosaurs and other vertebrates at this time is that we have this kind of latitudinally extensive, so like pretty broad north-south stretch here, a fairly narrow coastal plain um, preserved, which is where we find a lot of our terrestrial and coastal fossils. And it's kind of sandwiched in between the, the mountains coming up on the west and this seaway. And in particular, for the discussions today, I'll be focusing on uh, the Belly River group. So people are very familiar, I suspect, with the Dinosaur Park formation and the Old Man formation. The fossil material I'll be discussing in detail will mostly be coming from this upper part of the Old Man formation um, down in southernmost Alberta around the border to Montana. And along this sort of narrow stretch of landmass, what's been noted by a number of authors is that there's both a sort of climatic zonation in here, where we have in the south these more hot tropical, the subtropical communities, and then in the north, we seem to have these um, sort of warm temperate, um, too, if you're getting a little bit further to the edge of it, subtropical communities with not a great record in between, but clearly some sort of transition happening in there. And it's been suggested that where we see sort of what we would call provinciality or, or sort of different uh, clustering of different uh, fossil groups in one area versus the other, that it might be mediated by this, this climatic zonation. Um, but on top of that, what's really interesting that we see as well among some of the large animals, sort of shown in these uh, images from, from some old papers, is that we get an unusually restricted set of biogeographic ranges for some of the large, um, large animals. So things like large um, herbivorous dinosaurs, ceratopsians, hadrosaurs, and so forth, where you'll have entire assemblages of different species in a given area, and if you go relatively not too far south, um, into a different basin, you'll find often a very different assemblage of sort of the same families of these organisms, but whole different species um, being roughly around at the same time. And that's unusual when we think of the distributions of the large herbivorous things like mammals today, where they'll often have much greater latitudinal distributions than something like this. Um, similarly, other research has suggested that some of these uh, animals, particularly these large herbivores, might be preferentially found more towards coastal areas or more inland areas, and that they might be partitioning their landscape based on some sort of um, preference for certain foods that are in those areas or a sensitivity to certain environments across these altitudinal landscapes, a distance from sea level. Um, and the exact cause of this is not fully clear, but again, as I mentioned, climate has been suggested as one driver, but there's still a lot of missing information. And even at a smaller scale, um, we're not always certain exactly um, what the, or the composition is of an individual ecological community at a given point of time in a given place or what the animals in those systems were doing. And so before we can get at answering some of these bigger scale questions, we need to get at looking at sort of smaller scale questions um, in the local communities. And that's uh, where my work that I'm talking about today comes in. So the sort of fossil sites that I use for this primarily are what are called vertebrate microfossil bone beds or microsites. <clears throat> So these are these concentrations of fossils, often many hundreds or thousands of fossils um, that are being sort of attritionally deposited over a small period of time in these ancient uh, wetland and river systems and then being left for us to find. These things are really useful for an ecological uh, analysis because compared to, say, looking at isolated skeletons in the rock record, which can have many meters of rock between them, potentially representing thousands or tens of thousands of years, um, everything in this individual site is going to be collecting over a comparably smaller amount of time. And so we're seeing a sort of slightly biased but still pretty good sample of um, what the ecological community would have looked like over a relatively small area, over a relatively small period of time as like a point sample in the geologic record. And then we can compare these sites over time to get a better idea of what's going on. And when we do something like that, it often looks like this, where some kind of ecological analysis, we're, we're looking at these colored bars here, are um, relative proportions of different groups of animals, sort of how they change over time, how that relates to environmental changes across the landscape. And again, that tells us some of the big picture things of like when, when we're in certain sort of environments, we have these groups that are more prevalent versus others. 
Um, and it shows that, yeah, we can absolutely track sort of major changes in the ecosystems through time using these fossil data. But this doesn't allow us, again, to get at questions like what were, like in the, the pink here, some of the dinosaurs, like what was that animal eating? Um, so that's, again, we go even finer than this. And there are a number of different ways we can do that. Um, I'm gonna focus on one of those ways, but I'll first introduce um, some of the different types of uh, evidence that people have used before to look at diets and ecological niches and competition among different animals of this, in these systems. Some cases you have fairly direct evidence. So here's a paper on Borealis Helta that Caleb uh, was, one, was the lead author on where sometimes you have a specimen that actually has some kind of stomach content data. And that's great because then you know that that thing ate that. Uh, in other cases we have fairly clear inferential data. So things like the height of some of these large herbivores, their adult size is quite different. Things that are much taller will be able to feed at a higher height than things that are really low to the ground. That's fairly straightforward. Other times, um, we, have, we have situations where diets are less, less um, easy or, or differences between the animals are less easy to figure out. So in some cases, among many of the small theropods, um, their tooth morphology is used as an inference for diet, and in some cases, that also is, is relatively clear because we have good correlates today of things that have teeth just like that. Um, in other cases, like the troodontids, it's not always super clear what's going on. And I'll get to, get to that a bit more later, but in this plot from back in the 90s, we've shown that troodontid teeth, you can see that just by looking at them, are very different in shape than a lot of the other theropod teeth, and that has led to hypotheses of them being either uh, still carnivores, but eating something different than say like a dromaeosaur does or a tyrannosaur or being an omnivore, or even being fully herbivorous. And so a lot of this has been sort of debated over time. Now, we want another way to examine these things. That's where this chemistry can come in. So as a quick little review, before I get into how we're gonna use it, um, just I'll be using like elemental and isotopic as terminology a lot, so just as a quick reminder, uh, basic element like carbon, and this has a, a mixture of neutrons, protons, and electrons. This will characterize what element it is. So it has six protons. We have carbon here. As it, in this case, uh, the most common carbon has an atomic mass of 12. But we also have these naturally existing things called isotopes, which are variants of these based on generally different numbers of neutrons and different atomic masses. So in the case of carbon, so a very common element, um, about 99% of carbon in the environment is this carbon-12 here. There's also a small percentage, but 1% in the natural environment, of what's called carbon-13, which is an isotope of it. Uh, you have carbon-13 in your body right now. There's um, carbon-13 everywhere, but it, it roughly sits in the environment of a proportion of about 99 to 1 um, with carbon-12. And because it weighs very slightly differently, it will, be, it will behave in chemical reactions very slightly differently. And so, in different, um, as we'll get to in a second, when carbon is sort of consumed by an organism, for example, or is involved in some sort of chemical process in the environment, differences in the reaction rates um, of these things, based in part on differences in their weights, can lead to you changing this ratio of 99% of to 1% in whatever um, ultimate compound or tissue results from it. And that, from that, we can use that sort of predictable um, change to figure out what's going on and use this as a tracer of some kind of activity in the ecosystem. Uh, just as an aside, people are probably more familiar with the term carbon-14. That's the radioactive um, carbon isotope. This one's different than these other two in that it is unstable, whereas these two are called stable isotopes. For the purpose of the rest of this, all we're really concerned with are, are these sort of stable ones because we're gonna be using this to, to look at things like diet. Um, the, the radioactive ones are used for things like absolute dating in the rock record, but not as applicable for, for looking at these ecological inferences. Okay, so this, these geochemical proxies are, are interesting and useful in this case because the stable isotopes that we were just talking about, they exist naturally in the environment. They're not really going anywhere. They're just being moved around. The relative ratios of them will be altered by, again, environmental processes, so in some isotopes, that'll be something like temperature that, that affects it, or based on preferential metabolic activity when you eat something, that will change the proportion of one isotope versus another that you incorporate in your body. Um, 
And because these differences are fairly predictable and reliable, we can track those changes in the rocks, we can track them in tissues of organisms, assuming they can fossilize, and use that to look at, say, what something was eating. The various factors that influence this can be pretty complex, so I'm not gonna get into all these right now, I don't really have time, but just suffice to say, most of these things can be sort of calculated and accounted for in order to make the inferences that we're going to talk about. Um, and the way we do this is generally by um, measuring these things in a controlled environment uh, in living animals um, or in, in living plants or both. Um, so you would take like, in this picture I have an alligator. You could theoretically take an alligator um, and only feed it a certain thing for a certain amount of time and you can figure out what the isotope composition of the food was and then what it ends up being in its blood or in its bones or in its teeth or in its muscle or its scales and figure out how the isotopes are, are sort of being incorporated into that body um, from the raw materials that it's consuming from the environment by food or water. And in something like carbon, the main way this is used in a lot of ecological work is to distinguish what herbivores are doing. And the reason for that is that carbon isotope values that we will measure, the single biggest difference we see in them is based on the type of photosynthesis the plant is doing. In a modern environment, in and in a also relatively recent fossil environment, you will have sort of two very distinct groups. They're called C3 photosynthesizers and C4 photosynthesizers. And these things, because of that pathway of, of producing the, the sugars through photosynthesis, operates a little bit differently. They produce very different values uh, of carbon isotopes. And then if an, uh, an animal here eats that, it will have values that are closer to this than they are to that. And that's the way that we tell that apart. The problem with this in a context of something like a dinosaur is that when dinosaurs were around, for the most part, there, there's just the C3. We don't have these C4 grasses around. So everything is gonna be more or less starting like this. There is a, an amount of variation in here, and so we do try to track that, but carbon is a little more limited than what we can do um, in the context of a thing like a dinosaur. But we still can track sort of the base plant in the system, and there are differences among these, these plants if you're eating sort of like low-lying ferns under a canopy, or from like, um, like trees in open sort of areas, or from aquatic plants, there'll be slight differences we can track. And we can also track, um, to a small extent, how that moves up the food chain, and how, through this thing called the trophic enrichment factor, sort of, the, let's say the deer in this case eats a plant, the carbon values in its, in its tissues that it grows from that raw material will be slightly different than this. And then when the wolf eats the deer, they'll be slightly different than that in a sort of fairly linear fashion. And so we can use that relative proportion change to get a rough idea of, of sort of steps in a food chain. We can do the same with these dinosaurs. Even better than this, um, or, or complementary to this, you can also look at a similar process in um, not isotopes now, but elements. So trace metals uh, in what you're eating um, relative to the major elements of what you're made of. So if we look at the ratio of a, of a trace metal that doesn't, isn't really doing a whole lot um, in terms of like actual biological activity, things like strontium or barium, and the ratio of that to a really important element biologically like calcium that's a big part of some of these tissues, we can measure that and we can see, again, when our herbivore eats the plant that has a certain amount of strontium and barium relative to its calcium, this animal will now have proportionally less of it. And then when something eats that, it will have proportionally less of it. And this process is called biopurification, and we use that to, to track, in a much more distinct way, changes in, in food web position and diet. Um, and we can do that again with our fossils. And what this biopurification refers to here is that, let's say when this deer is eating these plants or when the wolves eat the deer, the material that's being brought in, the body's going to uptake nutrients and materials from that, but there's different, um, the way that it's doing that, the way it's absorbing those materials differs in different organs, and certain organs will say preferentially absorb calcium compared to something like strontium, which it doesn't really want as much, and so the relative amount of strontium to calcium, which will remain fairly static, will mean that this ratio gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller every time you go from a different link in the food chain. Another thing you can do with these isotopes that will be the sort of the other big part of this, not just looking at diet, is tracking 
what habitat they're in and, and how they're moving around. So some isotopes like oxygen um, are strongly influenced by environmental conditions like temperature or humidity or by the metabolism of an organism. So warm-blooded things or just cold-blooded things. Um, and we can use that to get a rough idea of sort of where in the environment things are living or how an environment is changing. And we can do the same thing with another isotope, um, which a lot of the work I'm doing now is, is focused on using, which is strontium. And strontium is interesting because strontium isotopes mostly just reflect whatever bedrock you're near. So if you live in the same place all your life and you're always eating food that was sort of grown or, or lived around there um, and drinking water from water around there, uh, like streams or, or, or whatnot, then the strontium in your body will look like the strontium in the bedrock around you. If you go to somewhere else where someone else has lived for a, and not really moved around, say like this dinosaur here, its strontium signature in its bones, its teeth, and its other tissues will look like the bedrock that it's around. If instead you have something like this guy who's moving back and forth between them, its strontium values will be a proportional mix of the bedrock signal from both places. And so if something is, say, migrating, we'll be able to try and we, we can potentially detect that. In some cases, and I'll show you a slide on this in a little bit, uh, people have been able to get really high resolution records of this in, in things more modern. And in one study, they sort of sampled through a woolly mammoth tusk. They could see where it was going sort of from week to week in, in Alaska. We can't do that necessarily with the dinosaurs as easily, um, but it's the same principle. The other thing is uh, ocean water has its own sort of strontium signature, which is related to bedrock, but it's not exactly the same. And let's say if, if our ceratopsian here was, was preferentially hanging out near the coast versus more inland or was moving back and forth between them, you could also sort of detect that change. And so by combining these things together, these ones we can look at changes for diet and, and food web position or um, the sort of temperature and environmental conditions of a place or movement patterns, we can get a, bit, a better picture of what these animals were doing in their ecosystems and, um, and what their kind of ecological preferences are. So the goal here is we, we want to powder the enamel, let's say, on a tooth. This is a, like a sort of Celestine, I think. It's a small raptor. And we want to take that and analyze it and get the sort of values we were just talking about for these different types of isotopes um, and, and then sort of see what were they doing. One of the problems we have, though, um, particularly with some of the things like carbon and oxygen, where there's a lot more variation involved, is we don't always know exactly what um, we should expect. A lot of the literature in the modern on carbon and oxygen isotopes focuses on um, ecosystems and environmental conditions that are not super suitable or not that similar, at least, to the ones that existed in, say, um, southern Alberta at this time. So a lot of work is not on these sort of isotopes in the modern. It's not focused on sort of more fragmented, swampy, coastal plain type landscapes. It's on things like grasslands or uh, temperate forests or whatnot. And so it may work exactly the same. The patterns and distributions of different species might be exactly the same. Um, the amount of sort of aquatic and terrestrial resource interchange might be the same. But we need to actually figure that out first. So this is why I said we're going to look a little bit at the modern before we get into the fossils. So first, what we're going to do is I'll show you what we would call a baseline reconstruction. So I'm going to look at an environment today that is fairly similar um, in, in aspects of its environment and ecology to what Alberta was like 75 million years ago and look at the isotope distributions and carbon and oxygen there and then do the same thing in Alberta with a, a, one of these microsite fossil sites. And then from there, we have our baseline of comparison and then we can start testing some of these other uh, diet questions, for example. So where, where today is kind of like Alberta back then? There's a few places. Um, there's some areas in Southeast Asia that are a good, a good fit for it. Um, but closest at hand is sort of the US Southeast Coastal Plain. So Alberta, about 75 million years ago, fairly warm. Um, from our coastal plain deposits we have, we're looking at a fairly fragmented sort of wet landscape at the particular interval that we're sampling. And right now, somewhere like Louisiana or Florida or South Carolina, depending on exactly where you're sampling, um, is a pretty good fit for this. In our case, we chose to sample um, for this comparison in what's called the Atchafalaya River Basin, uh, this big, extensive um, suite of wetland environments in sort of central to southern Louisiana. And the reason we did that was partially because it was a good fit, that's obviously the main reason, but also because um, compared to other 
possible target areas in the US, um, this one is relatively undisturbed. There's no truly undisturbed area from human, human interactions, but this one is a lot less disturbed than some of the comparator ones we had looked at in like South Carolina or Florida. And the way we went out sampling this was a little ghoulish, um, so I apologize if you don't like images of, of roadkill, um, but we went down and we made contacts with some of the local universities and the fish and wildlife guys, and we made arrangements with them for, for targeted sampling of different species. But they also told us like, hey, if you wanna just go around and see what you find, go for it. And so we did, and our polite term for picking up roadkill was opportunistic sampling. And we went all around these areas and we found an incredible amount of dead stuff. Um, I think in like two days we found 20 something species and 50 or 60 individuals, absolutely insane. Um, and I said the area is relatively free of human contact, that's, or, or, or constant interaction. That's kind of true. Um, there, are, there are two big roads that cross right through it though. Um, one goes over the top of it, so that's not really hitting it too bad. One does kind of cross through, and it's on that route, and then like under and, and beyond that major interstate is where you know a lot of this ends up. And then we also worked with, uh, like I said, Fish and Wildlife, and then um, if any of you remember that History Channel show, The Swamp People, um, we found where they, they live down here, um, and we went to their place, and we were like, hey, you guys have any stuff that we can, might be able to sample? And they're like, yeah, sure, we, we got these gars out back, we got this gator, like, and then, so they gave us a whole bunch of things. Um, I think, I don't know if you can tell from the photo, you can see where he shot the gator in the head there, it's pretty gruesome. Um, but anyway, super nice, they were really happy to, to help us out, like for the gator, it was like, as long as you don't like damage the pelt or whatever, or the, the skin. Um, so we took like a tooth, we took some claws, took like a little bone sample, it was great. We used that to generate these data, looking at, this is so like, this is from bones and teeth, and I'm gonna, we did soft tissues too, but just because of the fossil comparison and time, I'm gonna stick to, to just talking about the bones and teeth. We sampled all these animals, these different species, and these are their ranges in that sort of isotope space. Um, I kind of color coded it off of dietary categories from um, what we know they eat from observational records. And it looks something like this, and um, you can see there's a lot of overlap, which is sort of what we expected. Um, what is interesting is that in contrast to some other modern sites, the degree of overlap with some of the aquatic um, species in the area and semi-aquatic species is a lot higher. So we have a lot of overlap between the terrestrial and aquatic environments, which you know, kind of makes sense. This is a very fragmented landscape. Um, most of these things are not feeding exclusively terrestrially or, or aquatically. I mean, I assume the fish are feeding mostly aquatically, but for other, other things. Um, the other cool thing we recover across this, mostly from the oxygen, but also a little bit from the carbon, um, based on like aquatic plants versus uh, fully terrestrial ones, is a bit of an environmental gradient where we, you know, we know where we sampled each specimen and on that map, and it r roughly maps out kind of like this, this nice gradient across the landscape. So that was really cool. So now, we're gonna look at the fossils and see like what does their distribution look like with these same proxies in this relatively similar ecosystem. And so the site that we'll be sampling for this, or we, that we did sample for this, it's called the Rainy Day Site. It's uh, down south of Medicine Hat near Many Berries, turned between Many Berries and One Four, for those that know the area, um, not far from the Montana border. And the Old Man Formation down here is sort of um, extends further than uh, in, say, like Johnson Provincial Park but it's, there's a time equivalent interval. And so we're sampling in that time equivalent interval here. And there's the site up there. And um, this is one of these vertebrate microfossil bone beds. It preserves a really nice uh, diversity of, of different species. And it preserves this kind of um, fairly wet, sort of muddy environment. This is in the part of the old man that's transitioning away from the sort of channel river uh, dominated component further in the middle of it and into looking a lot more like the Dinosaur Park formation. Um, and so when we plot those isotope data up, it looks something like this. So again, a lot of overlap between the aquatic and the terrestrial components. Um, if we compare the two, the modern and the Cretaceous, you can see that the overall relative distribution of things is fairly similar, so that's good. Um, that gives us some confidence for then testing additional hypotheses in the fossil ones later that the basic um, interactions and structure of the system is not wholly different from, from the systems today. In our, yeah, um, similar degree of terrestrial and aquatic overlap. And we did notice that the amount of sort of isotope space occupied by the herbivores in our modern system was quite a bit larger 
than those in our uh, Cretaceous one, but the caveat there is that our Cretaceous sample, well, the only ones we had enough sample size to, to really analyze were the big herbivores. So there are small herbivores, small herbivorous dinosaurs and other animals in the system that we were not able to sample because we didn't have enough material. Uh, so I suspect that's kind of what's drawing a bit of this, that like in here we have, you know, browsing herbivores, we have semi-aquatic herbivores, we have arboreal herbivores, we have a whole mix of things, and here it's just like our, our really big mega herbivores. Um, but nonetheless, if we're interested in saying like how the diets differ between these, these three large groups of herbivorous dinosaurs, these data are not providing a ton of information. They're a little bit different, but they're, they're still broadly overlapping, which would suggest they're largely eating similar foods. Um, and I'll get into testing how we can get further to that in a second. One of the other last things we did with this baseline comparison is we wanted to see sort of how reliable some of our oxygen data were. And one way we can do that is you can use the oxygen um, isotope values to calculate the temperature in a given place. And we can then do this in both our modern system and our fossil one. And we know independently what the temperature of the modern Louisiana system is, so we can actually use that to check if our numbers make sense. So in our modern system, what we do is we use the oxygen isotope values we get between our sort of warm-blooded and cold-blooded uh, animals in the system. There's, um, we can use an existing relationship between uh, how, that, how the oxygen isotopes um, relate to temperature and to these um, differences in the sampled bones to calculate an estimate of mean annual temperature which we got, which was about 21, 22 degrees-ish. And we can then look at um, you know, the actual measured temperatures of that area. As I said, most of these guys were sampled around that Atchafalaya River Basin. Well, it just so happens that the United States Geologic Survey has a water monitoring station uh, a few kilometers south of where we're doing most of this work. And it samples the water temperature every 15 minutes, every day, every year for about the last 30 years. So we have a really nice value for how water temperature ranges in this river where all these things are living and drinking. We also have um, weather stations nearby where we can calculate annual temperature, or not calculate, just look at the measured annual temperature and um, warm month mean and cold month mean. And you can see that they're fairly congruent. We're off by a degree or so, but I think it's pretty good considering this is just a bunch of roadkill. Um, and so with that in mind, being able to get a fairly accurate temperature value from an opportunist, opportunistically obtained sample of modern animals that gave us a bit more confidence that what we do with our fossils, which are also opportunistically obtained in their own way by what happens to be preserved in these sites, is still gonna be giving us something that's fairly uh, valuable, fairly useful. In that case, we get a value for southern Alberta this time of about 18 or 19 degrees Celsius, um, which is obviously much hotter than today and it is largely congruent with several other uh, ways of calculating temperature at this time. So you can use um, plant data. This is sort of an older number from some plant data. Um, and then there's some more modern values from nearby. This is not Alberta, but it's, it's sort of just over into Montana. Um, and the values do sort of largely line up. So I think that's, that's fairly good there too. And that's another way that we can make this comparison of this baseline between the modern and, and the fossils um, using these isotopes. And that's all well and good. But we actually want to know what these things ate. So um, the next part here is testing some actual hypotheses of, of niche partitioning among these big herbivores. How did they separate their use of the landscape? Um, did any of them migrate, for example? Um, do we see any sign of that? And then I mentioned before that we had some of these small theropod dinosaurs, some of which have diets which seem fairly obvious um, based on the shape of their teeth and the shape of their bodies and whatnot. And then others where it's a little less clear, like those troodontids. So we'll, t we'll see how uh, their isotope values look um, relative to each other and um, what we'd use that to predict their diets. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier on, there's been some hypothesized differences in how these three big groups of, of herbivorous dinosaurs that are living alongside each other are, are partitioning their landscape. Um, there's been a suggestion that certain groups possibly ceratopsians and ankylosaurs prefer areas that are a bit more coastal relative to the hadrosaurs, or at least that the hadrosaurs don't seem to have as much of a preference generally and are just kind of everywhere. Um, that's something we can test here. And there's also been um, some arguments about possible competition and, and diet and dietary specialities between the three. And even looking at the differences in their teeth, you can sort of predict there would be something different about them. And I think, Caleb, you mentioned that Jordan was here last week. Okay, so Jordan Mallon, if you saw his talk last week, probably talked about some of this. I don't know exactly what he was talking about. 
But um, him and I have a student who's working on some of these questions as well, which I won't get into that stuff this time, but um, I will get into some of the general patterns in the ice tip data and how we can tell these guys apart. So if we look back at that fossil carbon oxygen data I was showing before and we take everything else out and just show these big herbivores, we see a lot of overlap in their ranges. Um, and so that would suggest initially that there might be a lot of overlap in what they're feeding on. But I also mentioned earlier on that carbon isotopes at this time are not as useful for distinguishing what plants something is, is eating back then compared to today because the biggest important difference in, in carbon isotopes for plants is the type of photosynthesis you do. And at that time, there was really only one of them that was very common in these areas. And so that kind of limits the amount of difference that is possible at that base plant level in carbon. So if we, what about if we look at some other proxies to see how they might be doing different things in the landscape? And that's where we come back to our strontium. So I mentioned how strontium worked before, having a bedrock signal. This is an example of that, that Woolly Mammoth study where they tracked in the, the strontium number, strontium values um, in its tusk, and from that correlated to the strontium values for different types of bedrock in Alaska. Um, and they were able to kind of figure out where this thing was moving around. What we're doing here is a little more basic. So we don't have a nice long tusk, and we don't have like a perfect record of every value in every bedrock site because this is much older. But we do have the shed teeth of these different groups of herbivorous dinosaurs, and we're looking at the average ranges of strontium that each one has um, at, like that, at the family level. So hadrosaurids, ceratopsids, and ankylosaurs. And the results look like this. We get a very clear difference here between what the hadrosaurs are doing and what the other two are doing. Um, what's also interesting is I mentioned that the strontium values in a given area tend to tell you what the bedrock is, and that just influences kind of everything that's locally in there. The values of our hadrosaurs, so in the lighter green here, are kind of intermediate between the local values at this rainy day site, um, and I'm not showing it here, but we also have values of like fish and crocs and small dinosaurs, and also other things that are probably not going too far um, that are all kind of in this range as well. The hadrosaurs have values that are intermediate between these values, the average of all of them, and values um, about 100, 150 kilometers away in Montana. So that suggests that in this case, these guys might be moving sort of between these areas and that what we're seeing is um, a bit of a mixture of, of strontium signatures between the two places. To put that on a map, um, there's that range again. And that correlates to kind of like this. So two or one and three on here would be these, this, and that. And so they're kind of walking in this kind of range. What's interesting is that this actually fits some similar data from hadrosaurs that was uh, done more up around Dinosaur Park, where it looked like they were kind of moving a similar sort of range, kind of like where I'm circling with the green here. So that's kind of cool that we're having corroborative evidence of this, of these things having a, a, a fairly broad um, foraging range. And what's also interesting for that is that this maps out fairly nicely to um, the, the general typical range of, um, of individuals of African elephants and sort of how much they tend to, to forage around. Um, what's, it, what's additionally interesting, we're not actually sure of an answer yet, is that the species that we're measuring here don't really have enormous ranges across the continent. As I said before, when you go too far south or north, you tend to have a whole different um, assemblage of species that's not necessarily true in like the elephant example. You'll have African elephants sort of over a fairly wide latitudinal range, even though individuals are not necessarily always making that big trek. Um, but building on that, we can then look at those trace element to major element ratios I mentioned to look at, are there differences uh, in the, the diets of these large herbivores? We're not expecting to see sort of really big differences because we're, we're not expecting any of them to be carnivorous, but if they're eating plants that are growing in sort of slightly different conditions, they will potentially have different trace element compositions at their base. And so that can then get into the, the food chain because all these shifts at each food chain level are all relative. Um, when, we, when we do that, we can see this is sort of the, the range of distributions that we get of these three big herbiv herbivorous dinosaur groups. So again, our hadrosaurs are more distinct from the other two in strontium isotope ranges and a little bit in the trace amounts of strontium element they have relative to calcium in their bones and teeth. 
and we see that in ceratopsians and in chylosaurs. They have a lot of overlap um, in the strontium isotopes, but they, they do have a bit of distinction in our barium calcium ratios. So it could suggest a slight difference in, in what plants they're eating. It doesn't give us exactly what, what it is, but it, it does provide a bit more information than, than the carbon did initially. So to sum all of that up of what's going on with these large herbivores at this time, and we still have more work to do, it looks like, um, as best as we can detect, hadrosaurs are feeding a lot more broadly than the ceratopsians or ankylosaurs are. Um, we're getting a bit of a signal in this difference here that represents feeding height stratification. So the, the hadrosaurs are much taller. They can reach higher plants than the uh, ceratopsians and ankylosaurs. And the way, we can, the way we can infer that is because um, one of the other things that can influence strontium values a little bit from what their bedrock signature is, is uh, root depth of the plants. So plants, like big trees and whatnot, that have, on average, sort of deeper roots, are, have been shown um, in a number of modern environments to more closely map one-to-one -one with the actual bedrock of an area. Uh, Low-lying ferns, bushes, things like that, um, that are just sort of growing in the soil and have um, shallower, more dispersed roots tend to uh, be a little bit influenced by um, local variability in strontium. So whether if there's strontium coming in from dust in the air and getting mixed in the soil, or if you're in a coastal area like this one is, and you're having a lot of sea spray on a, like a annual basis coming in, that can get mixed in with the, um, with the soil as well and slightly alter the strontium levels because um, seawater has its own kind of um, fairly particular strontium value at a given time in, in the geologic record. And so I think that's a component of what we're seeing in terms of this difference, but uh, it's sort of a mix of those two things. And then it's possible, looking at the distributions of certain modern plants today and different herbivores today, um, some of this difference, particularly um, in the barium values, could represent um, feeding on stuff sort of closer to the ground, and, and um, maybe even like subterranean like tubers, things like that. But that's more of a hypothesis than something we can truly support at this point. Okay, so we talked about herbivores a lot, but what if we look at the rest of, or, or a, a broader sample of our terrestrial community? So here are those element ratios again, and remember, these things get more negative as you, more depleted as you get um, higher in the food chain. So things that are low will be like your high level carnivores, high level consumers. Things that are up here will be low level consumers, so things like herbivores. So when we plot on here, we have now, we have some lizards, some small mammals. Unfortunately, not a great diversity of small mammals. We only have sort of one family represented. Um, we have our dromaeosaurids, we have troodontids, we have tyrannosaurs, and we, we do recover a fairly good trend um, across these different levels um, in the trophic system, sort of like a, the food web. And if we want to put like a sort of simple division on here, we'd say that we have our sort of herbivores, our large faunivores, and our sort of mixed feeding faunivores, lower level consumers, and omnivores. Um, one, er one reason why things like tyrannosaurs might be so distinct from some of the other potentially carnivorous animals like dromaeosaurs um, is if these things are not just eating herbivores and, and other like things uh, in this sort of range of the food chain, but are actually eating you know, these guys as well, or maybe cannibalizing each other to some extent, that'll keep pushing their values more and more negative, right? Um, there is one thing on here that kind of stands out as a little unusual from what we were predicting, and that's uh, these guys right here, troodontids. These are the ones that have those really weird teeth. People weren't really sure um, what their diet uh, should be constructed as. And our values here place them a lot closer to herbivores than anything else. So, what has been said about troodontids before? I mentioned that people have had a lot of ideas about their diet, but what specifically were they? Okay, so their diet has been historically unclear because this kind of tooth shape with these big hooks on it is fairly similar, to confuse things initially, um, fairly similar to pachycephalosaurs, so very distantly related dinosaur groups, and they're also vaguely similar to some modern uh, sieve feeding um, seals. By mechanical tests on these and the and teeth of other um, theropod dinosaurs, I suggest they have a much these have a much lower resistance to force compared to some of the um, dromaeosaurids and tyrannosaurs, the ones with these like 
more knife-like serrations, which suggests that maybe they weren't eating the same way as those animals were. And there's also a very interesting pattern that the teeth of these things are fairly rare, even in these microvertebrate sites, but the one time that you, the one kind of instance where you see them very abundant and repeatedly abundant is where you have concentrations of um, Ornithischian nesting sites or eggshells. So like hadrosaur eggshell layers frequently seem to have lots and lots of these troodontid teeth. Lastly, there's been, I think, one instance, maybe two, I think it's just one, where some troodontid fossil uh, partial skeletons have been found with these kind of aggregates of mammal uh, skeletal material next to them that have been interpreted as regurgitolites, maybe think like an owl pellet or something. So the idea being that they ate those mammals. And so that's a lot of different possible things, like their teeth aren't that strong, they're being found around nesting sites, maybe they eat small mammals. Um, and so as a result, there's been a range of different suggestions over the years, whether they're fully faunivorous or carnivorous, whether they're potentially a mix of that or, or some level of omnivory, whether they're even fully herbivorous, which has been suggested a few times. And our data here would suggest that omnivory, and it's a safe answer, but omnivory is probably what they were doing and that um, certainly uh, some large amount of plant material was in their diet based on their close association with the ranges of the herbivores in contrast to everything else. Um, I wouldn't want to discount their occurrence and close occurrence with those eggshell sites, so I think it's very possible that they were feeding on a number of different things, but in contrast to say dromaeosaurids, I think um, this suggests that the troodontid diet did have a fairly good chunk of plant materials in it as well. And so, just trying to wrap some of, of those um, inferences up. With these uh, different isotope and other geochemical proxies, we are able to detect sort of large scale diet and, and habitat and movement differences um, among some of the dinosaurs that we've examined so far. And going forward, we're expanding some of this sampling um, through time across multiple sites to see sort of how these distributions change as the climate changes and the landscape changes. Um, and also doing more detailed analyses at the scale of individual species. And so I mentioned Jordan Mallon before, who was here, the speaker last week. Uh, him and I have a student right now who's looking at uh, sampling in the dental batteries, um, the jaws of these hadrosaurs, to look at how their diets and movement patterns and potential migration changes um, over the course of like juvenile to subadult to adult over that lifespan of individual animals. Um, and at finer scales than just like all hadrosaurs. Um, and we're seeing some interesting patterns in there as well that I don't know if you talked about or not, but those, that'll be coming out fairly soon. And yeah, we're working at trying to expand this to, to further dietary tests and, and habitat use tests. And ultimately the goal being to be able to look at all these patterns and understand what's going on at this fine scale level to be able to scale it up to test these sort of bigger picture questions of what's going on at the scale of whole regions or across the continent or in response to major climate change. And with that, I'll wrap up. I have many people to thank and they're all here. Uh, thanks all of you for listening and coming out. And uh, does anyone have any questions? <laughs>